Hello there, welcome back and welcome to part 51 in my build log series of the Trumpeter 1-200 scale model of the Titanic. Today I am working on the dome over the aft first class staircase. Now, the Trumpeter kit as it is comes with what I think is actually a pretty good piece of sort of um, clear plastic which acts as the dome. Um, and there's a number of things you can do to that to make it look a bit more authentic, which I'll show you. Um, but for me personally, I'm going to use this set instead for my domes. So this is a sheet of uh, flat photo etch. Uh, it's made by Mini Brass, and I'll pop a link in the description below. So if you want to get this, follow the link and you'll find it. Um, and you get some really beautifully detailed domes. Obviously, these are flat. So the first job I'm going to have to do is to bend these into shape. Uh, which is by no means an easy task, um, but quite an engrossing one. And um, in contrast to the plating I did in the last episode, it's some really quite fine, fine metal work as opposed to the slightly more sort of heavy handed stuff that was going on over there. So that should be quite interesting. Um, first off, I want to say a big thank you to John Hollis because uh, John sent me these um, and I'm really grateful. It's one of these sets that it's just once you've got it in your hand, it is so beautifully detailed um, and I mean you'll see later on in the episode how nice this is but it's so nicely detailed um, so it's a really wonderful addition to the model and you know the, the dome over the first class staircase is such an iconic part of Titanic that it's really nice to have something that does it justice like this does um, so thank you very much John um, and I'll show these in more detail later on uh, also worth saying I'm using this which is a China 3D printed part uh, so this is the sort of protective dome cover that goes over the top of the dome. Uh, again, more on this later on in the episode. But for now, let's crack on. Now, we can't just crack on and start bending straight away because the brass that we start off with is going to be very, very hard. Um, and I've just got a piece of, um, this is just scrap brass from another set, but you can look and see. When I bend it, it just springs right back. It's incredibly springy. Um, it takes... A reasonable amount of deformation before you get any actual change in the material shape um, and even then it has a tendency to spring back so brass in this state is not going to be very easy to bend into a dome and certainly when you think about the very small bits of brass on our dome um, it's just not going to work so what we need to do is we need to change this into a state where it's more workable we need to soften the material and we can do that through a process called annealing so annealing is a heat treating process and what we do is we heat up the metal to a certain temperature. Um, I won't go into the real detail of it and I really don't, I only half understand it myself, but essentially you heat it to a temperature where the actual crystalline structure of the material can change. Uh, you then hold the metal at that temperature for a certain amount of time and then you cool it off very rapidly, in this case by dunking into some water. So that's what we're going to do now and I'll just demonstrate it on a piece of scrap brass before I do it on the actual dome and I'll show you the difference between an annealed piece and a non-annealed piece. So first off what am I using? Uh, I'm using this. This is a, a gas powered soldering iron. Uh, you can put various different soldering iron tips in there um, and it's very useful if you're um, if you're tinkering around with stuff that needs soldering where you don't have access to an electrical supply, maybe you're fiddling around with your car or something like that and you don't want to run an extension cable out to the car, this can be very useful for that. Um, but it also works for this job because it gives you a very good localised source of heat. Right, so off we go. And all I'm doing is I'm just working the flame back and forwards along the brass. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the brass to go a sort of bluish kind of colour. We certainly don't want it to start glowing red. When brass glows red, that's a sign that it is quite literally about to melt and turn into a blob. So if your brass glows red, uh, you've got it far too hot. We want it to go a nice blue colour. Uh, don't think that my brass is glowing red. That's just because the flame is emitting light and it's bouncing off the brass. So. My brass isn't going red, but it is just getting to that bluish kind of colour now. As you can see, it's just starting to go blue. It 
it almost looks like a bit of oil has spilled onto the surface. That's the kind of appearance you want to go for. Okay, so we're pr pretty much done now. So what I'll do is I'm just going to dunk my brass into the glass of water. Turn off the flame, of course. And just, you know, keep the brass in there till we're confident it's going to be cool enough to touch. And there we are. And you can see what I mean about that slightly kind of bluish, almost like a sort of tarnish. So there we are. So just to show you a little bit more what I mean by going bluish, um, the piece of brass in the lower part of this photo has been annealed, and the, um, the piece of brass in the upper part of the photo hasn't been annealed. And you, you can see what I mean by that slightly kind of bluish purpley colour that's um, gone on to the lower piece of brass. That's the sort of thing you're aiming for. So here we are, the part's cooled down now, and you can see that we've got that nice sort of bluish kind of colour. Um, a little bit of light sanding will return this to the um, the same appearance as the non-annealed brass. So don't be concerned about any visual effects that annealing will cause. Now, just to demonstrate what annealing allows us to do, I'm going to bend this about 90 degrees from end to end. That's 90 degrees. And if you look, when I release, it's hardly actually bent at all. It's pretty much sprung back into the position it was in before. And if I do the same process with the annealed section, you'll notice by comparison, there's a lot more bend. And this is actually, this is exactly what the annealing process does. It allows us to manipulate the metal far more than we could before. We're able to manipulate and twist and bend and shape, and it retains that shape. Whereas if I tried that with this non-annealed section, same kind of stuff. It springs back much more readily. Uh, and the reason for that is because the non-annealed brass is a lot harder. The annealing process has made this a lot softer. And obviously, when we come to shape our domes, we want much softer metal that we can manipulate nice and easily, rather than a harder metal. And of course, the good thing about this is it allows us to bend and stuff without creating loads of internal stresses within the metal, which is absolutely ideal. So what we're going to do now is we will anneal our actual brass domes and then we'll start bending them into the appropriate shape. So off we go. It's worth noting that these pieces of brass are much thinner than the bits I just demonstrated on. So I've turned the flame down as far as I can and it's just worth bearing in mind that this will reach temperature way faster than the others did because this just requires far less thermal energy. There we are. So just dunk it in the, in the cold water. Nothing, no harm's going to come to it. It's brass, it's not going to rust or anything like that. And there we are. That should be now all ready for shaping. Right, so now let's get on with the process of actually bending our dome. Now, if only we had a piece that was the right shape for our dome. Well, fortunately, we do. Uh, this is a transparent piece that came in the original trumpeter kit. You can see that it has some domey kind of marks on it. Um, and to be fair to Trumpeter, again, it's not actually that bad, really. I think, you know, the, the Trumpeter kit, as it as it comes in the box, gets a lot of hate. Um, and it deserves some of it, and I think it doesn't deserve other bits of it. And to be honest, I think these are pretty good, really. Um, the brass is better, but I, th I think there's, the transparencies are pretty good. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bend over the top uh, and I might at points as well put it inside and bend from inside as well. We will see how we go. What I'm going to start with, I've got a selection of things and we'll see how we go and what works better.
So there we are. And doesn't it look nice? Um, I'm not looking forward to doing the oval one, I have to say. Uh, it's worth noting the set comes with two domes, uh, and I, I basically made both uh, and then chose the one that I thought was best. I didn't see any point in keeping the other one, um, <clears throat> so I just made both. And as it happens, the first one I made actually turned out to be a wee bit better. So that's where we're at. So um, this dome, of course, wasn't made of brass on the actual ship. It was made of iron, so it needs to be painted thus. And then we'll install it and start looking at the dome cover. It's worth saying, of course, that my um, bending of the dome and stuff was done over a, a, a good hour of, um, of work. Um, some of it I filmed, some of it I didn't. Um, but each of the two domes that I made took me about an hour each uh, and that was you know rolling checking rolling on the um, on the plastic part from the trumpeter kit rolling with that ball thing that I was using um, so there was a lot of sort of you know gradual gradual work and it's worth pointing out as well that um, halfway through I re annealed the the dome again um, now the reason I did that is I wasn't entirely sure if it was necessary, and I suspect probably wasn't necessary, but um, brass does what's called uh, work hardening, so um, it's pretty much what it says on the tin really, um, but as you manipulate the metal it hardens, so essentially as you manipulate the metal you're undoing the annealing process. Um, and because the, because the metal's getting harder as you work it, the likelihood of you snapping the spindles of the dome increases. Uh, so that's why I annealed it halfway through, just to sort of undo that work hardening uh, and to make sure it was nice and soft again. Um, but as I say, I just want to make clear that despite the video being relatively quick, um, this was not a quick process. So I'm also going to show you a method for improving the uh, glass dome that the trumpeter kit comes with. Um, and this might be um, perhaps you um, perhaps you don't want to spend any more money on the model than just the base trumpeter kit, or um, perhaps you're just not interested in add-ons, or perhaps uh, you're you might be a bit worried that you if you bought the brass you might just damage it and not be able to use it. Um, for whatever reason, if you don't fancy using the brass, this is a method for improving the look of the domes that are supplied in the trumpeter kit quite easily and simply without really needing to do too much. So what I've done to start with is I've just painted a layer of black paint all over the dome, as you can see, all over the dome like that. And what I'll do is I'll just set that down and let it dry for, I don't know, five, six, seven seconds, whatever. In the meantime, I'll get a cloth and I'm going to spray it very lightly with some isopropyl alcohol. And then what we're going to do, if I can pick up the dome again, so we're just going to go over this with this rag I'm just going to wipe off the excess paint. So you can see I'm not doing anything particularly tricky here. I'm just wiping off excess paint. And what you're left with is what I think actually looks pretty nice, really. It's the dome. What you're left with is all of the lines in the dome are left with that paint impregnating them. So you still get that nice sort of wrought iron effect. So if I take it off the, uh, the blue tack I was using to hold it and put it on a piece of white paper, you can see that those lines now really stand out and pop that little bit more. Um, so if you're not if you're not super confident or for whatever reason you don't want to do the wire mesh dome that I have, that is a good alternative and it'll give you a good result and it'll make that dome stand out because it feels like a shame for it not to stand out because it's such a famous part of the ship. You know, everyone thinks, ah, Titanic, first class grand staircase, the big dome over the top, don't they? 
Um, so that's an idea. So back onto the brass dome now, uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm just going over with a very, very fine paintbrush, and I'm picking out all of the areas that were gold leafed on the real ship. So I'm just using some renderings I found of Titanic's Grand Staircase here. Um, I'm just picking out any areas that need highlighting in gold. Take your time on this. So here's the dome now ready for install and as you can see I've used some gold paint just to pick out some of the bits that were gilded in gold on the real thing. So we'll get the rest of the model ready for it and then we'll install this. Right, so now I've got my dome, uh, I need to build the containment structure around it. Of course, a wrought iron dome with fine glasswork is a pretty delicate thing, even on a ship the size of Titanic. So Harland and Wolf weren't stupid, they didn't just leave it exposed, they put a containment structure around it. Uh, and this allowed them to do various things. Clearly it provided a level of protection, um, but also it allowed them to sort of in, uh, backlight it. So if I take this top off there were lights that surrounded the dome, and this gave the impression that the dome was lit even in darkness, which must have been really quite impressive if you looked up. Um, so I'm going to be using this. Um, this is a China 3D print, which I've been sent for free, uh, and I've been sent quite a lot of different bits from China 3D. Uh, this is the first one I've got to, and this is the first one that I've actually been able to use in my build, so I'm quite looking forward to it. Um, so I'll be using this, um, and as I work with this, I'll talk through my feelings on it and I'll sort of do a review as I go. Um, if I wasn't using this, I would be using um, this surround, which comes as part of Trumpeter's kit in its own right. Uh, and I'd use this piece of photo etch, which came in the KA set. Uh, and you can see how it works. The photo etch just plops on the top nice and easy and you glue it down and there you go. Um, Again, like with a lot of things on the trumpeter kit, it gets a lot of hate and it probably doesn't deserve all of it. And this is pretty good, really. It looks pretty nice. Uh, it's clearly not as good as the China 3D print, but it's pretty good. Um, if you just have a look at the photo etch versus the China 3D, you can see where the um, the superiority lies. Things like the, um, the surrounds on the panes of glass are just that bit more pronounced and the um the curvature is a bit more accurate here than it is on the trumpeters surround um actually the height as well of the dome structure is significantly improved in comparison to trumpeters attempt and you get other things you get the sort of detail of the boxing around the side you get detail of the portholes which are not on the trumpeters piece um there's also these planks of wood that were stored by the side of the dome as well. Um, so this is a far superior part, and this is why that's why I'll be using this. Um, but as I say, if I didn't have this, I would have been using this stuff. So I'll pop those to one side. Right, let's crack on. The first thing that I've done is I've painted the inside of the dome structure in black. Uh, the reason for this is just because light's going to be coming out of here when the ship's lights are on and I wanted to make sure that light wouldn't bleed through the actual resin itself. Clearly no problem with it going through the windows, but I don't want it shining through the walls. So a nice thick coat of black inside should hopefully protect against that quite well. And so nice and simple, having sprayed the inside black, I've now sprayed the outside white. And that's pretty much the dome cover done. I need to put some glass in the windows, but that's a fairly easy job. Uh, so we'll now move back on to the dome and looking at putting some windows on that. So on now to the dome's glazing. As most of you probably know, the domes on Titanic were not clear. They were populated with sort of frosted glass. Um, <clears throat> and I've been sort of working out how I'm going to do this. Um, and at first I did flirt with the idea of not doing it at all and just plonking the dome without any glazing straight over the top. Because I did sort of think, ah, but then I can see the grand staircase beneath it. And I thought, you know, that would actually be quite nice. But too much of me just thought, no, it's not accurate. It's not what it actually looked like. So what I've done is I've done a bit of testing on my other dome over here. And I've come up with a way of sort of glazing 
the dome with some frosted glass. So it's really quite simple. Um, the other side shows it a bit better, but essentially all this is is UV resin with a little bit of white paint mixed into it to make a sort of creamy kind of colour. Um, and then we simply use a, a fine point. I've been using some brass wire, but whatever really, just to stretch it in between the panes of glass to a point that the surface tension holds it in place. Uh, then you cure it and you're left with this sort of, it almost looks like an enamelling actually at this scale, but when in place, it will look like frosted glass in the dome. So that's what I'm gonna do. I've done enough testing on this piece now to be content that it works and is a sound principle. So we'll move on now and do this. I'm gonna film it, but I'm gonna film it in fairly low light because of course the problem with UV resin is that it wants to cure. Um, and I need to produce UV resin with some white paint in it. And I want to do it all in one batch because the problem is if I make one batch, do half the dome, and then it cures and I have to make another batch. It's very difficult to mix the ratios again so that you get the same level of frostedness in the second batch, if you see what I mean. So I'm wanting to try to do it all in one go. Um, so I'll be filming it in quite low light and that gives me a bit more time to work. So we'll crack on with that, then we'll get the dome in place and then we'll do the finishing touches to the cover. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna mix up uh, some resin. And there is some paint. And this is just standard enamel white paint. And I mean, there's no real science to this. Make sure it's nicely mixed because you do want this to be a solid colour. I don't want there to be sort of streaks of lighter and uh, less. You know, I don't want more clear sections and more translucent sections. What I'm sort of going for here is, as I say really, translucency. I don't want it to be solid white and I don't want it to be absolutely clear. Imagine a sort of jellyfishy kind of colour, I suppose. That's a bizarre. Uh, I've never used jellyfish to describe a colour, but I guess it kind of works. That's about what we're looking for. So, what I'm going to do, put the paint to one side, get my dome, and with this bar, pick up a bit of resin, probably not that much, and just wipe it on like that and you'll see the surface tension sort of holds it in place then shine some uv on it to cure it and that's it nice and simple and there's the result now notice that i'm doing it from this side not that side and the reason is because i want i don't want any resin to come over the top of the um the dome the, the metal work on the dome that i've already painted so i'm doing it from the underside and i'll do one sort of section and then we'll move on to time lapse Unfortunately, my camera cut out there, so we're going to have to go again. Uh, as I was saying, um, as the voids we're filling get bigger, we have to use a bit more resin to keep the surface tension. But it is still possible. And once you've, once you've cured it, that's sort of locking it in place, you know. So there you go, you can see. 
So far, so good. So that's one full section done and one of the bigger pieces done, just to sort of show that it is possible. Um, I'll now move into time lapse and do the rest. Um, but you know, as with always, just take your time. Right, so I'm just about done, so I'm just giving it a good long soak under the UV light, both sides too. Uh, and what I'll do as well is I'll just pop it um, on a window ledge or something so it gets some natural UV light as well, and I can leave it there for a while. But look at that. Looks great, doesn't it? Really does look nice, and actually, what I hadn't quite considered before doing this, but a happy sort of discovery, is that the the sort of the creamy white glass emphasises the um, the ironwork very nicely. So you actually see the dome a lot more than you would if it was just lying as it was before without any any um, glass in the panes. And it also just emphasises the gold leafing as well. Um, so I'm very happy with that. I mean, that does look absolutely smashing. Uh, on the inside, it doesn't look so good, but that's because there's different thicknesses of um, resin. You know, in, in a few places where windows were bigger, I had to use a bit more to get the relevant surface tension and so on. So you can see it does look a bit less good inside, but who gives a toss? You're not going to see it inside. The outside is what matters, and that looks absolutely cracking. So I've now glued the dome in place. Um, what I did was I did a very light amount of gluing around the outside just to make sure that I got the dome in the right place. And then I did some much more heavy gluing on the underside where the aesthetics are a bit less important. Uh, so the, the dome is now very securely held in place. So here we are with the dome in place. And of course the real tragedy is that we're gonna cover it over in a couple of seconds. So we're not really gonna be able to see it all that well, but it does look absolutely lovely. So I had to get some glass into these windows just to make sure that they had a bit of a shine to them. So all I've done is I cut out a square of plastic and then sort of tack glued it in at all the points where the windows are not touching the frame. You can see I've just I've only glued on the areas where there is actually framework in the way so you can't see any evidence of gluing from the outside. And so there we are, in all its glory. You can see there's a little bit of squeeze out from the uh, the light stopping tulip paint that I use. Uh, but what's good about this is when it dries, it goes rubbery. So you can just scrape that off uh, and it won't leave any impression on the decking below or on the deck house above. So lovely. So another little bit of the boat deck done and a very attractive part of it too. Uh, very happy with how this has turned out indeed, actually. It really does add to the model really, really well. And moving on into any other business now. You might remember at the end of the last episode there was a giveaway. Um, and thank you to everyone who has entered that. It finished on the 28th at midnight, uh, and I'm pleased to announce that the winner is Lee Robertson. So, um, Lee, very well done. Follow the instructions that I've sent you and we'll get those parts sent across to you as soon as possible. And so that brings us to the end of this video. Um, quite a lot of time spent on what is a comparatively small area of the ship, I know. Um, but all really worthwhile and interesting. Um, as I said at the start, you know, it's such an iconic area of the ship, it seems a shame not to spend time on it when I can. And again, thank you, John, for sending me these domes. They are a really lovely addition to the model. Um, and it's been very interesting, you know, coming up with different solutions to different problems as they present themselves has been really, really good fun, actually. So um, I hope it was useful. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, if you have any questions or comments, pop them down below, and I'll do my absolute best to get back to you. 
Um, if you've enjoyed it, like and subscribe, use your YouTube comp, um, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.